Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Well, here we are again, Farusha. Thank you for waiting. I'm sorry I got held up, but you know, New not Jersey traffic. Not to <laughs> worry, Miss um, Kate Valentine. Here we are again. Mm -hmm. This is our 74th podcast. Whoa. Yeah, it Whoa. is. It is, honestly. Whoa. And to Slate, today is August 21st, 2018. Mm. And we have just a, an extraordinarily interesting guest. But before I introduce him, I want to mention to you that one of our earlier guests, I don't know if he was about number five or seven or around then, if you recall, was um, uh, Ross Dunseeth from mm -hmm. UVA. Mm -hmm. And he happened to be uh, speaking to us a lot about a fellow named Energy Ed Edwards. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Energy Ed this past week. Mm. And uh, while I was sitting in an audience where he was participating, all of a sudden there was shattered reality on mm. on the um, on the screen, huh. uh, and he called it Shattered Reality Radio Show, but still, nice. But he Very still nice. he still uh, put us up there on the screen, and I had to introduce myself as to who I really was mm -hmm. afterwards. And he was he was tickled that I had come come to his uh, demonstration as well. So now that we've got that. Um, uh, squared away. Do you have anything to start out with before nope, but we? No, I'd also like to say thank you to him. It's very nice. Yes, yes, very nice. He's an interesting gentleman. He's an interesting man. Um, runs that electricity through his body. There's no doubt about that. The other stuff, I cannot, um, I cannot speak to. But um, Tesla wannabe. Well, anyway, <laughs> yes. Um, today we have a, an extraordinarily interesting man joining us. Uh, his name is Dr. James McLennan. He is a Ph.D. sociology professor and licensed clinical social worker. He has been the author of four books, uh, Deviant Science, The Case for Parapsychology, Wondrous Events, Foundations of Religious Belief, Wondrous Healing, Shamanism, Human Evolution, and the Origin of Religion, and the book we're going to talk about today. The Entity Letters, a sociologist on the trail of a supernatural mystery. Now, originally from Maryland, Jim has lived in Ecuador, China, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, and North Carolina, and travels extensively. He, I think he's now in Virginia. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. James McLennan. Hi, and thank you for being with us, and welcome to the show. Yes, well, welcome. thank you very much. Welcome to Shattered Reality. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just was fascinated by the Entity Letters book, um, and I would start with um, saying that your statement towards the beginning of the book uh, regarding suspending disbelief uh, really resonated with me, uh, but perhaps you would like to tell us two things that I think are necessary for anyone listening to this to understand. Could you, A, explain what SORAT is, and B, uh, what a mini lab of uh, Dr. Cox was? Well, SORAT stands for Society for Research on Rapport and Telekinesis, and the mini lab is something that William Edward, Edward Cox constructed to test the, the paranormal phenomena that Surratt allegedly produced. And that, that mini lab, the mini lab, it took various forms, but one form was a kind of like an inverted aquarium, which was had metal bands which bolted it down onto a, a wooden platform, and in the platform were micro switches which if anything moved within the mini lab, then it would switch on a camera. So that was one of the, the ways of testing this phenomenon associated with Surratt. Now, you have a number of photographs in the book, 
of the mini lab. <laughs> and um, I recommend that people, you know, refer to that in reading your book. Um, so the SORAT group, uh, maybe you could go into a little bit more depth as to where they were, who they were, the time frame, that sort of thing. Well, the whole thing started off in 1961. It, it was founded by a very famous poet, John G. Nyhart. And, and he, was a, he was the poet laureate of the Plains States and also the author of a, a best-selling book, Black Elk Speaks. It's, he was very familiar with Lakota Sioux shamanism, and he befriended this Native American black elk. And this this is a book was a, a very early uh, demonstration or indication of of Native American culture. So in 1961, he was pretty old, and he was a professor at the University of Missouri. And he gathered together college students there at the college, and the idea was to try to recreate spiritualist phenomena, that they were going to engage in table tipping. They, they would gather together, put their hands on the table, and in the, spiritual, in the spiritualist era, the table would move around, and they would hear raps coming out of the floor, and it was a way of communicating with the spirits. So in 61, they, they attempted this in October, and by uh, late December and early January, they started getting raps coming out of the floor, and the, and the table seemed to be moving. And then the phenomena kept increasing. They found that the raps could be communicated with one rap equals yes, two rap e raps equals no. And then later on, it, they, 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 it began to use a kind of a, a spiritualist code. One rap equals A, two raps B, three raps C, four D. So the raps were able to spell out words and, and provide messages. Then as time passed, the table the table movement became more vigorous and the table would get up in the air and they'd take their hands away from it and it would levitate up in the air. So they would they were they were pretty cautious and they wanted to verify the authenticity of the phenomena. So Nyhart had them tape record this each session and they also photographed the table whenever it was levitating. And so this happened in, in the 19, early 1960s, but there was a strong reaction from uh, the authorities, I guess you might say. Like, for example, the, the college authorities, and they were, began investigating this, and they expelled some of the students. One student lost her, her visa. Uh, another student lost his money funding, so he couldn't go to college. Oh, boy. Uh, and and so they they and people were there, the question is maybe this is demonic and we can't do this you know here in Missouri it's just not acceptable so they they kind of became less open and and kind of went underground and they continued meeting but they it, it wasn't they were careful who they invited and they continued meeting and so when I became involved in the case in 1981 they had been meeting for 20 years and. Wow. Uh, it was a it was a very strange thing to fall into. And indeed, it was. Go ahead. Okay. Why, why why do you think strange? What do you mean? I mean, obviously, table tipping to the average person seems strange, but in, not to you. I mean, what did you find strange about it? Well, it does seem strange to me. I hadn't. I had uh, become curious about paranormal phenomena, and. I had started reading the parapsychological literature, and during that era, the 1980s, the parapsychologists felt that they could demonstrate extrasensory perception under controlled conditions. But psychokinesis is something that most people don't believe in. It's, it's kind of like uh, hauntings and poltergeists and things like that. Well, I decided I'd do my PhD dissertation on parapsychologists as a form of deviant science to see how, how was it that parapsychologists could continue for year after year and yet never become accepted? How, how could it continue going on for such a long period of time and not become acceptable science? So I, I went around the country and I interviewed all the parapsychologists in the U.S. and most of them in Europe, and I worked on my dissertation. And the parapsychologists began contacting me and suggesting that I investigate haunting cases, which, which were in Maryland where I was. 
And so I went out and I interviewed people and I was amazed that, sure enough, people have these kinds of experiences. But that, and then when I, when I began attending the parapsychological meetings, that's when I ran into Ed Cox. And he had just uh, completed uh, a film, his filming of this mini lab of the phenomena, and he showed the mini lab film at the conference. And I'm telling you, it, it really looks bizarre. It looks, it looks stupid. Okay. It looks silly. It looks silly. It looks like it's, it looks like stop action photography. The objects will be in one place, and then the next frame, they jump somewhere else. And they, they go jumping through the front of the glass, the mini lab, front of the mini lab. And things start levitating and floating up in the air. And it looks like, I mean, if you were a magician, you could create that. You know, It looks like it could be done by fraud without much effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, except that there were some scenes which were very bizarre, like uh, a, a paper could burst into flames spontaneously and... Uh, it looks like there's wind blowing things around, but some things are going one way and others are going another way. So it would, it would require a certain level of expertise to fabricate it uh, more than more than a normal person would have. But it, was, it seemed like it could be fabricated. Well, anyway, Cox invited me to, to, to see what was going on out there in Missouri. And in 1981, I went out there and that's what, that was the beginning of my problem, I guess you might say, <laughs> because the there were wraps coming out of the floor. They could, they could, the wraps came out of the floor and that you could have a conversation with them. They would make a wrapping sound. Like say you say to the wraps, hi, well, they'd start wrapping A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, O, H, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, I, oh, hi. Hmm. They say hi back, you know, and you could have a conversation. You could ask them a question. They would answer it. And then they would ask you questions. Hmm. So, so it's as if, you're communicating with something, you're not sure what, but something. And then they did the, the table tipping phenomena. You put your hands on the table and it, and it, it would move. It would have like a vibration, like a, there's electricity in it or something. It, it would seem impossible that a human could do it, could produce that effect. But, but maybe possible, you know, like maybe it's possible. I mean, I could, you couldn't be, it seems implausible. But perhaps, you know, and, and then one event after another would occur. It, everything becomes more and more implausible. It becomes, becomes more and more difficult. But never, it, it always seemed like there was a possibility. And, and it seemed, the, the, the camera, like for example, I interviewed the different SRAP members. We're talking about, oh, dozens of people, maybe 30. Tom Richards was... Dr. Nyhart's research assistant. He was a graduate assistant. And Dr. Nyhart died in the 1970s. And so Richard and the other SRAP members, they just continued meeting and they continued getting this table movements and wraps and table levitations and poltergeist phenomena. And sometimes the whole room would shake like an earthquake. Mm-hmm. So. Wow. That's the kind of thing I'm confronting with. Except that when you, they, they would show me their scrapbooks, they they all had scrapbooks, uh, they, because apparently for the last 20 years they had been getting a table to levitate. Then they grab their camera and take pictures of it, mm-hmm. and they put it in the scrapbook. Uh-huh. But but they would also put pictures of it when it wasn't quite. Some people would have their hands on it, and it looked like people had their thumbs underneath the top of the table, like they maybe they were lifting it, you know. And so they say, well, you know, that's just the way they, the spirits, they want to make you think it's fraudulent, you know. Are you familiar by chance with the uh, practice of having a person um, lie down on a table or sit in a lounge chair and uh, have six people, uh, three on each side of the person, and just putting um, the first two fingers of the right hand underneath um, alternately the um, armpits, the knees, and then somewhere midway, and that the person levitates? Yes, I'm familiar with that. And a lot of people have done that, haven't they? A lot yes. of people have tried that experiment. And it seems it seems like uh, 
something's going on, doesn't it? It certainly does. I, I did it when I was a teenager, and um, it was just amazing because it felt like no weight on my fingers at all. And I'm a small woman. I've never been a strong woman. And so given all of that, um, it was not through the mighty use of my fingers or uh, the mighty use of the fingers of the other girls around the the person being lifted. And we tried the, the heaviest person amongst us to lift uh, after we had done it, you know, several times. And it, it was really no problem to... Um, to lift the people up, and they seemed weightless. What's do, do you have a have a thought on that? Well, there's theories which explain this type of thing. Uh, for example, there's a parapsychologist, Kenneth Bachelador, who he argued that the reason why psi doesn't work very often or very effectively is because people have an inherent fear of psi. Oh yes, they're, they're afraid of it occurring, and they're afraid that they'll that they will be held responsible for it. So he thinks that's that's innate in humans that we that we thwart the phenomena because of our own inner fears. And he argues that artifacts overcome these obstacles. So when you lift up the person, it could be your muscles that you just don't realize it, you see. And so but then once the person gets up, people see it's happening and that results in belief and then that allows the authentic PK to occur. So that could that's a theory which could explain the Surratt phenomena. In other words, it could be people are pushing the table around in the darkness, then it starts moving, they don't realize that they're actually doing it, but then that helps them overcome their fear. So then that helps the table to rise up and then authentic phenomena is possible to occur and they take pictures of it. So this explains how this thing becomes possible. It's a, it's a theory uh, and it, it helps us, you know, we can work with that, create hypotheses from that. Well, that brings up something else that came into my mind as I was reading your book, and that is that um, I was surprised that you exhibited no fear about bringing some of these things into your home or um, uh, sleeping next to the... Um, the mini lab in the basement of um, uh, of the uh, Tom and Elaine, um, because uh, it it would seem to me that before you have established what these entities are, are they really the uh, ghost of departed individuals, the spirits of departed individuals? Are they? Uh, is it uh, somebody's super psi, as it's called? Or is it some discarnate entity that was never really alive? And we, we never find that out for sure in life, and neither did you, I guess. Well, I had done a number of haunting investigations previous to going out and, and talking with the Surratts, and I had encountered all manner of different ghostly things, but they never seemed to be able to verify themselves uh, completely. Uh, and even demonic, I, I, some people had it, even demonic things, you know, uh, malevolent spirits. But, uh, you know, I was a Vietnam veteran and I had, I guess I have fallen off the, the edge, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I, I think I've pretty much over, uh, I think I'm pretty much over the hill with regard to uh, being afraid. I think I've been about as afraid as a person can get. And. It seemed to me, I, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of different people, and uh, some of my Surratt friends have asked, well, this is, could this actually be demonic? And I said, well, if you think if it were the devil, he'd have a little more, more ability to verify himself, you know. <laughs> this this it is kind of like uh, putting salt on a bird's tail or something. It, it, the spirits kind of lose, in, in the face of skepticism, they, they, they seem to lose their power. Uh-huh. That that, and you're right. I guess I perhaps I should have, perhaps I should have been more worried, and my my lack of fear destroyed my academic career. In other words, I, I have wasn't able to teach at Harvard or Yale or any important place. Uh, so certainly, I perhaps I should have been more afraid, and I recognized the the thing I was the thing that I was worried about was my reputation and and losing uh, credibility. That, that I guess that was the thing which I was most 
caused the most anxiety for me. I, I didn't feel that the phenomena could harm me. I, I don't, uh, I guess, you know, I guess I have a, I guess I have a kind of a, a, a religious foundation or a Christian foundation. And I, I don't think that the devil can hurt me, you know. Well, and no, I agree with you on that, but I, I think the fear is not so much you, is, but the fear of the people who are in established places, because anything you're investigating, uh, you, know, you sort of have that in common with UFO beliefs, too, is that, <clears throat> you, you know, that uh, people really are afraid of uh, the disruption of, um, you know, the order that they've already created, and, you know, you're a direct threat to that, of course. Well, I, I've a lot of people have, talk about uh, uh, saying prayers and uh, burning candles, or they do rituals, mm. and uh, I I wanted the phenomena to occur. I was just very, very curious. I was very curious, and I wanted to see it. And that's the bottom. I guess that's the bottom line. That was a, that was my main motivation. I think that was curiosity. Yeah, are, are you capable of creating these events yourself, or were you just a, a witness? Uh, I'm sorry, your the audio is not perfectly clear. Oh, okay. Yeah, it sounds a little odd. In this. I was just saying, are you? Uh, did you? Were you able to create these uh, events yourself, or were you a witness to them? Oh, I, I, I don't know. The Surats seemed like such regular, normal people. Mm -hmm. And when I, they, they, they're very regular, normal people. Tom Richards and his wife go to the Methodist church across the street. The other young people were like me. Some are graduate students, some are students. The people were just so absolutely normal that it, the, the thought that this could be something malevolent didn't cross my my mind. Mm -hmm. Now the the idea is maybe we're creating the, the phenomena ourselves. In fact, that seemed to be a very logical hypothesis. It seemed that that was happening. The people present were affecting the phenomena. The people who were there, we were shaping. That seemed to me, to my mind, what was going on. And I think my skepticism was thwarting the phenomena. Well, that's what happened with the Philip experiments, no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, that that just to recap, um, a group of uh, interested individuals, fairly intellectual, decided to create in their mind this character from the past called Philip, and they gave him an, a complete identity, and then he seemed to continue to exist after. Um, th they went away. I mean, that's a very encapsulated, and perhaps you want to speak to that a little bit. Well, but they found that that entity was unable to come up with information that was not inside their minds. Uh, it, this, the phenomena, the Surat phenomena wasn't controlled by the belief, by that belief. The, as, as founded by J.G. Neihardt, the idea was that the Surats would allow the phenomena to be however it was, and that then by observing it, we could increase our scientific understanding of it. So the Surats were open to the idea that it could be spirits, and many Surats believed that it was spirits. Others thought it was their mind, and they were open to the idea that of it coming through the mind. I think Tom Richards was willing just to allow it. He was going to, he, his feeling was that we just accept it the way that it was. And the way that it was was very, very, had very high level of trickster qualities. It, it was a it was like there's something non-human about it or something very, uh, a strange sense of humor, a, uh, a almost a, a cheating characteristic, a hiding characteristic. It, it was hiding from verification. So I think, you know, you've, you've had George Hansen on your program. George, I think that's how, where George got the idea was his encounter with the Surratt phenomena. It, well, it was very, very clear that we were dealing with a, with kind of a trickster. Mm -hmm. He dedicated so, his yeah. book to uh, Ed Cox, I believe. Yeah, and Cox himself was a was a quirky fellow. He had done a lot of research, a previous field research, and and now I have come to learn in my over the years, the more a person exposes themselves 
the higher their level of belief becomes. And so he he was very, he had a high level of certainty that there was, the phenomenon was quite possible. And, and, and I think that facilitated it. He facilitated the phenomena occurring because he accepted it. He, he didn't know what it was, but he accepted it. That's that's a, I, <clears throat> what the way you describe uh, Ed Cox is is it's really annoying uh, because he was truly the attic scientist, and uh, before all these sort of commercial scientific uh, investigations got started, that was the early science. And I mean, the fact that they were so uh, I, I don't know, smug about him and laughing about him. And I, I mean, the man was actually doing very good work with a very limited budget. And I, I, yeah, it was very, the, the attitude that he came up against was, I, I mean, I wasn't annoyed with Cox. I don't even know him, but the attitude I'm sort of familiar with, and it's extremely annoying. The attitude of other scientists. Mm. And, and we only have to look at the, uh, Dr. John Mack, the late Dr. Yeah. John Mack, yeah. who was um, a Pulitzer Prize winner, I believe, and, and a Harvard tenured professor, and they really uh, they really did badly by him. Boy, they tried to rip him up to shreds, but mm-hmm. he fought back. <clears throat> you do not threaten the orthodoxy. No. <clears throat> Science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, Hope it's not mine. Mm. Uh, so... Onward and upward, I I know that I had mentioned to you, and I am going to mention uh, just a single interesting corollary from my own life. Um, When I was a teenager, I found um, the book um, uh, uh, Black Elk Speaks by John Neihardt on my bookshelf. Um, It was a used book, clearly used book. It might have even had a piece of tape on it. I'm not sure. Um, and I was busy trying to graduate from high school and first starting college. And um, it was before I had taken any anthropology classes, so I did not um, attempt to read it. I was kind of inundated with the idea of getting out of high school and getting into college and doing what was necessary for that. So my intellectual curiosity did not allow me to, to look much at it, but I did, it did puzzle me. It puzzled me at the time because I don't remember having purchased the book. And um, my father, who was interested in Native Americans to some extent, he could have put it there, but he never mentioned it. And I don't believe I ever asked him. And he didn't just put most things on my bookshelf. He would, if he had purchased a book or something and was giving it to me, he would say, here it is, you know. And then um, later on, it appeared again in uh, an apartment that I lived on um, in on 12th Street in Manhattan. And um, I still have some access to that apartment. Um, and I have been meaning to try to look for it because I don't believe I transported it between the two places because it wasn't really, quote unquote, my book. So I'm going to continue to look for it. But I was, I, I found that to be passing strange given the the stories in your book about entity letters and the fact that uh, John Neihardt had signed, posthumously had signed some of the books that were out there. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes, Neihardt was a very interesting fellow. Uh, uh, a very, it, if you have time, it's, it might be fun to look up some of his poems. They're, they're, they're powerful poems about the Old West, most of them. And Black Elk was also a very charismatic, powerful medicine man. Uh, capable of of summoning rain when 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 the when the his people needed rain, for example, and Black Elk had been exposed to these things by hanging out with Black Elk. I mean, excuse me, Nihar had been exposed to this by hanging out with Black Elk, and uh, I think what happened was Tom Richards and the early Surratts they were exposed to it, and that that allowed them to do what they're doing. In other words, once once they saw it and experienced it then they could carry on and, and the phenomena could go on for year after year. So they were contacting and they were interacting with Black Elk. They also interacted with John King, a 16th century buccaneer and spiritualist uh, era uh, entity. And Patience Worth, she's a famous spirit from, uh, from St. Louis. And after Neihardt died, Neihardt himself would come through and make raps and communicate with people. And so in the 
it, when I first began in 1981 and 1982, it seemed I had experience with haunting cases, and, and I had the I had the theory that you should allow the spirits to express themselves, sure. and you should allow the the people you should allow the people to manifest their their creativity. That that in some cases there's is kind of a, some type of blockage going on, and and it, it's. It's good for people to say what they really think. So I left paper out for them to write on, and they 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 wrote letters and left messages, and then they were able to send things through the mail. And uh, so Nyhart w- was was writing letters to me and signing his name. It's and I thought, wow, totally amazing. Yeah, and, and creating new poems. And uh, and then he was signing books from other Surratt members. That, that had been published after his death. So I collected the signature. Okay, and that, so uh, I was in, I was caught in this Surratt thing, and, and, and of course the major hypothesis is that the people are engaging in fraud and that we parapsychologists are supposed to verify the phenomena. Well, I thought, well, we'll I'll have to take the, the signatures to a handwriting expert and see whether they're authentic or not. So I live in the Washington D.C. area, so I, I went down to the FBI and they sent me to this handwriting expert that they used, and he looked at the, I presented the, him with the signatures that I had, and he asked me to bring him uh, authentic signatures from different eras in Nyhart's life, which turned out not to be too difficult because he was a very public person and had, had written extensively all his life. So I brought him signatures from every decade of Nyhart's life, and he wrote his report up and said that one of my signatures was obvious. He was certain that it was a fraud, but that the two other signatures had been were, had been done so skillfully they could not pass judgment as to whether it was fraudulent or not. But if it was fraudulent, whoever had done it, whoever had created the signature, was a very very skillful forger. So. That just adds to the repertoire of behavior that we're attributing. If, if, if things are fraudulent, then I guess Tom and his wife Elaine Richards or some of the other Surratts, I guess they are also expert forgers. As well mm. as magicians, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not only are they thought to be incredible musician, magicians better than any professional in existence, but they're also able to do this forgery kind of thing. I, I was a little unclear. Where was the paper at this time? I mean, you left it on top of your desk, and then in the morning it was there, or the writing was there, or uh, was mailed. Some of it. Uh, uh, did it have a return? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I mean, not to be ridiculous, but uh, well, where'd they get the stamp from? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, the spirits. Yeah. Uh, people would provide them with self-addressed stamped envelopes. Okay. But but they would get stamps. They would get foreign stamps. Uh, and from all different countries and put them on the envelopes just as an extra. And they would also put all kinds of quirky stickers and they would put uh, medium stickers that you put in stakes and include that in the envelopes. Oh, that's funny. And they that's would, good. <laughs> they would include fortune telling messages from fortune cookies hmm. and put that inside and they, all kinds of strange things. Oh, which, talk which, about tricks Which phenomenon. often had a strangely, strangely meaningful uh, objects like, for example, they once sent me an advertisement for Japanese plates, mm-hmm. and at the at the time, I was I was uh, very curious as to where I would get my first job after I got my PhD, and mm-hmm. it turned out that my first job was in Japan. I went to I would oh, became nice. a professor. Nice. And sometimes it was uh, predated, right? The um, the um, the stamp on the letter was prior to. But I'm I'm still not clear. Where, where where was this paper? I mean, you had it in your desk or inside the mini lab. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. inside the mini out, lab. It started out inside the mini lab. Uh-huh. Like I, I I bought a postcard. I put a stamp on it. I addressed it to myself, and mm-hmm. I put it in. I had Ed Cox put it inside his mini lab, and mm-hmm. they they had no problem in getting things in and out of the mini lab. So it disappeared from the mini lab. And then it came to my house in Maryland. Oh, okay. So then, so then I sent back a, a, a letter, 
with a self-addressed envelope, and that same then that came back to me. And then other Surratts started running letters, and they and I was considered to be the 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 organizer of the experiment. So they would then send copies of their letters, and that they would they typically would send the re, a letter to the wrong person. Whoever had written the letter wouldn't receive it. It would go to somebody else, and that caused the Surratt members to interact with each other mm. continually. Uh, the, the, because the, the the mechanism that helps the phenomena occur is rapport. So the more people communicate with each other and interact, then the higher the level of rapport. So we were writing all these letters. That it was it, at some stages, I, I I I couldn't count. It would be like uh, maybe 20, 30 letters in one week. On the average, it was probably about a hundred letters a year that were were mailed out hmm. over over decades. Wow. Over many decades. So, so it almost seems like you have, I mean, obviously there's a lot of different uh, forms of parapsychology, but you seem to imply that there's a force behind all of them that just manifests itself differently. I'm, I'm sorry, the audio is not very good. Okay. Uh, it's, it's some kind For, of lack of clarity. But, <laughs> but, but the, I can hear both of you. And, okay, that's um, good. But th- this microphone sounds funny to me. So. Does it really? Yeah, okay, maybe. well, yeah, I okay. think, Kate, I think something's wrong with your microphone, perhaps. Okay. Uh, okay, we have to wait for uh, Bill to uh, to okay. fix that. But in the interim, but, could you a- answer, just answer the question um, that is having to do with this, that is that uh, there were some letters that had the postmark prior to when the letter was written, so... That yes. seems very anomalous to me. Yes, they they claim the ability to move backward and forward through time. Hmm. Yes, and so, the, of course, the alternate theory would be perhaps the postmaster had put a, a incorrect postmark on the letter. Hmm. So that somehow perhaps the postmaster had been bribed and had been bribed in such a way that he or she would be willing to put the incorrect postmark on the letter. And so uh, then as, as the experiment continued, then uh, Ed Cox received something, a missent letter. The, 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 uh, the address label had fallen off and the letter came back to him and it contained, it was a letter which contained all the entity letters with a note inside to the postmaster asking him to, to put the, a postmark on, the, on all these letters. You know, but not asking them to uh, to pre uh, to to put it at a previous date, just put it. No, post-market. just postmark it because that that only happened maybe two, three, four, five times. But but all the time they were sending letter with they were sending letters with strange postmarks like truth or consequences, uh, Arizona or Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or you know just quirky postmark. And so the, the letter inside, which was in the entity's handwriting, by the way, asked said that that, that said that this was from a postmark collector, that this that they were a postmark collector, and so they were asking the postmaster to to postmark these letters and then mail them out. And then so when the entities were asked about that, they said, Well, this is easier for us to do it this way. It saves a lot of energy. We don't have to use the psychic energy. And we can use the psychic energy for a better purposes like healing and so this is just we have to we do this is what we do, you know. Well, so just, it's it's, yeah. it's all in all extraordinarily amazing. Um, at this point, where you're looking back on this, primar- primarily um, about thirty years back into this, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, you may have done stuff in between, and in fact, I know you have. But um, what? Where do you come down with this? I mean, it, I'm gonna just throw it out there, like my thoughts first, and and you can tell me where you come down on it. Um, I am aware that there are all kinds of fraudulent things going on in the area of mediumship, etc. It's common. There are two kinds of fraud, people who are trying to be fraudulent, and a lot of goodwill people who want to tell you everything's going great with your grandmother in heaven. And they're just, you know, they want the best for everybody, and they're not trying to perpetrate um, a, a terrible fraud. But uh, if we leave that aside, some of the things that I have witnessed in my life and have experienced in my life leads me to to conclude through experience, not through some blind belief, but experience that um, some of these phenomena actually 
do happen. And um, the place where I can't make a decision because it, I, I, I'm not a believer, I always suspend disbelief and I'm not quote unquote a believer, um, is that there is something beyond the can of human beings uh, that we live in a universe uh, where we only see uh, less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum and there's all kinds of stuff going on around us, which probably does include some intelligent entities in some lower f forms, but I'm saying probably because I can't prove that, but that's where my thinking goes. Now, whether or not this is the ghost of your grandmother, Hattie, or um, whether or not it is uh, something demonic, I don't come down on that because got to say it. I don't know. So what about you, Jim? Well, I uh, had received, was began this as a sociological observer. I'm a sociologist. And so I was doing what we refer to as participant observation. I was participating in the group and then I was observing the group. And my observation was that every single person who participated in the group was absolutely certain that the phenomena had a degree of authenticity. And that was also my experience. But all the skeptical people and all the parapsychologists were totally in, unable to verify the phenomena. They were that, that not a single person who didn't was not participating in the group could gain even the slightest semblance of understanding about. The, the, the degree of power or of what was going on within that group. And so in 1982, soon after I began studying Surat, I got the job in Japan and I lived in Asia for four years and I had the chance to interview many, many shamanic practitioners. And I got to feel for what sh how shamanism works. It, it seemed to me, I came to the realization that, sh that Surat was very much like a shamanic group that the kind of thing which is going all going on all over the world, and it was this is humankind's first uh, religious form. This is what humans did when they were hunting and gatherers, hunters and gatherers all over the world was engage in this kind of behavior, uh, uh, gathering in groups, doing rituals, and it, having unusual, powerful and unusual experiences. And it it takes all kinds of different forms, but it has a basic physiological apparently physiological foundation to it so i would I, I came to the realization that this type of phenomena is beneficial for people it can have it, provi it provides hypnotic suggestions which can be beneficial and it, pro it provides placebo effects and and that helps people survive so it would have us so it, pro it would provide humans with survival benefits and so that's why we see religion having it has a genetic basis to it. It's, it's inherent. It exists in every society on the face of the earth. And so it gives us a, an understanding of the, some a foundation to that process, to that sociological phenomena. So um, I, I, I understood everything that you said uh, perfectly, but what I didn't get was you've this, where you have come down on it is that I understand the, the origin of religion um, and so forth, but um, in the final outcome, would it be correct to say that you perceive this as a being accomplished by um, benevolent entities? Well, uh, I don't know how to define the word uh, entity. Uh, I don't know what they are, and... I suppose they didn't harm. I don't feel like they harmed me physically. They certainly, it certainly did a job on my reputation. Just damaged my career as a sociologist. They, they certainly were tricksters. I came to regard that my whole this endeavor as a kind of religious or spiritual exercise. And the message that they gave was that the whole purpose of life is to raise your spiritual level. And I, I certainly, I certainly came to realize that. By thinking about your afterlife and by thinking about what it means to develop with rapport with other people and the, what the real meaning of life is, that that this this thing can be it can be regarded as kind of a, a spiritual endeavor, and that you can benefit from it. You can become a, a more well-rounded and a happier and more psychologically healthy person. And 
so I think that's that's where the whole thing is going. It certainly, I don't. It certainly has not had a, much of an impact on the scientific community, as as the early Surratts expected. Yes. So so we have to deal with the reality the way that it is. But I think it's funny that sociologists look down on you because let me tell you, if you go to a biochemist uh, conference or a AAAS conference, sociology is not really regarded as a true science. You know that. <laughs> So, I, I mean, it, it's sort of like the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, that, that's, I think, why <clears throat> I was so annoyed with uh, the attitude toward Ed Cox, because he was a man who was really doing exemplary scientific research, and that uh, he was treated that way was ridiculous. Well, having gone to um, a number of... Um uh, SSE meetings, uh, Society for Scientific Exploration, and some other kind of parapsychology events. Um, I am often troubled because there is a big argument if certain phenomena are produced by super psi or is it produced by the spirits of the dead. And I'm sitting there thinking that they have uh, created a binary option there. Um, where where it doesn't have to be binary. You know, it could be something else. It could be uh, visitors from outer space or entities or uh, disincarnate uh, beings that were never uh, incarnate on the earth. But uh, I just object always to the binary conclusions of the parapsychologists. It's either this or that. But it might not be this or that, after all. Yes, I think that's a pretty good uh, way of, uh, uh, it's a good perspective of recognizing. Uh, uh, also, also that issue that they've, they've developed is it, not something that they're able to resolve scientifically. So as a, I think as a sociologist, I, I'm trying to think along the lines of, of trying to uh, do research which can be resolved or can be tested. Mm -hmm. And, and Nyhart, I think Nyhart has an interesting position uh, that, uh, well, rapport is certainly very important, and it, it seems to be related with psychological health. So we should, I think we should, might think about so psychological health and, and what contributes to that. What, when groups get together and they develop rapport, that's very psychologically healthy for them. And uh, we can measure psychological health. So uh, that's, that's, at least that's a variable that makes sense for looking at. And we can think about spiritual healing. That's something that also can be measured. Yes. Because some people, some people recover. You know, people are, are faced with very severe problems. When, when a person gets a diagnosis of cancer, you know, not everyone recovers. A certain percentage of people die and some, a certain percentage recover. And certainly you would like to be one who recovers, you know. Mm -hmm. And we wonder what what helps that, what 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 facilitates that, and uh, I think this spirituality does contribute to that. It can it can it's very can have a be a very uh, useful uh, factor. And Nyhart used the term pragmatic mysticism. Now it's it's nice to be a mystical person, but it would be nice to derive some kind of benefit from it. Sure. So we, you want to keep your feet on the ground, you know. Well, that, that's one of the problems with <clears throat> UFOlogy, too. I mean, this stuff cannot be canned, labeled, and sold. So mm -mm, not a lot of money coming in from research. Uh, I, 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 it, the whole thing, like you almost seem to imply that uh, all these phenomena are just emergent qualities of a group of humans, like a psychological energy that presents itself as... Emerging quality of, of consciousness, Kate? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, the quality of consciousness. And then there's certain things that we can count pretty clearly. Like, for example, there's certain experiences that people have all over the world. Apparitions, paranormal dreams, waking extrasensory perceptions, psychokinesis, out-of-body experience, near-death experience, synchronicity, spiritual healing, UFOs. And uh, perhaps these large-footed animals, you know, or un unexplained animals. Uh, pe people, there's a the person who has one of these experiences has a far higher probability of having another experience. Mm. And and these and that propensity is associated with disassociation and absorption. So, 
which which has which is psychologically healthy it can it can provide benefits to people so so there seems to be a kind of a, a cycle going on and and these that that those factors absorption and dissociation seem to be triggered by childhood trauma a person who is exposed to high levels of childhood stress and childhood trauma then has a higher level of of propensity for the paranormal experience and and that those experiences are kind of a seed or a kernel which when when the person comes to terms with it and and integrates it into their life it, it can result in in a belief system which is very very beneficial and, and it can also work the other way too uh, some people uh, sort of create a evil type side to themselves and believe in it and uh, you know like son of sam and so i guess in some ways it's not always good it's a self-fulfilling prophecy i suspect mm. uh, if you think something's going to happen it's more likely to happen and going back to the the cancer situation if you believe you can heal you're more likely to mm. heal but if uh, with so many mm. people i think today they go to a doctor and the doctor says you have cancer and uh, it's cancer of the toe and the uh, life expectancy is uh, two weeks if you believe in it, that if you buy into the fact that you've got a tumor on your toe and you're going to die in two weeks well then it's more likely to happen that's that seems to be the case that there that the oncologists are sometimes are unwitting witch doctors uh, most definitely, and some of them are very good at it, and others not so good. It's a strange situation. Now, here's something that I found. I've been, uh, during my academic career, I gathered uh, spontaneous experiences. I, I would ask and have my students ask, if you have had an unusual experience, would you describe it? So we collected a large number of these stories, and, and the spiritual healing stories were the one type of story which elicited positive emotions more than any other kind of experience. And I found that there are two basic kinds of uh, categories of spiritual healing, and one category uh, seemed to revolve around uh, burns and skin disease and warts and things like that. And those types of disorders would respond very well to a folk healer, folk practitioner. And another kind of disorder might would be cancer and some kind of incurable illness. And those kinds of disorders often responded to a group prayer uh, and a church activity and uh, that a type of thing. So I don't. I'm not quite sure what to make of it, but it's interesting to think about. You better believe if I were had cancer, I'm going to have ask my church to pray. Oh yes. And, uh, and if you have some emergency situation, uh, you might try self hypnosis or hypnosis to relieve the pain and to reduce the inflammation, and uh, you know prevent the blood loss. Uh, which this, that that kind of uh, modality can be very valuable. Well, that is for sure. Um, moving up to the present time, Jim, uh, could you tell us a little bit about maybe what you might be proposing for yourself for the present and the future, what you've been working on, if anything, or are you writing, are you experimenting, what's up today for you? Well, uh, I'm a, I am working very intensely on a project right now that involves the Surratt notes that uh, Dr. John Thomas Richards kept during his life. He died in 2015, and in 2017, uh, I went out to Missouri and I, I collected all the available notes that I could find in the house. His his widow has pretty much left everything just sitting around in his office, and so all these notes are available. There's notes from over 700 experiments, probably over a thousand, but. I've categorized them and put them on my computer here, and I'm doing a statistical analysis because I'm curious. I have I have uh, two uh, uh, basic, or actually three basic hypotheses that I'm testing statistically, uh, because the notes describe all the people who have participated in every single group meeting. They describe the place where the where the meeting occurred. Tells the number of people present. It tells the degree that the 
the outcome, experimental outcome, whether the table levitated, whether it levitated after every state remained levitating after they removed their hands, whether it fell. It describes the, whether there's a photograph taken and, and what the effect of the photograph was on the levitating object. And it gives all the trans messages that occurred that for the spirits provided. So the, my theory is, if this bachelor door theory is correct, that a large crowd of people should reduce the probability of uh, levitation success as compared to a small probability. And, and so that that would be one hypothesis that we can test with this type of data. And then another theory the bachelor door offered, offers to us is that uh, it's possible for people to overcome their fear of psi. So the theory is, is that if a person participates in a large number of experiments, they should have a higher probability of success than a person who only participates in one experiment or two or three or like that. So we can test those hypotheses with this data. And that's what I'm working on right now. And actually, the, the, the hypotheses have been supported by the data, but there is a the, the most powerful propensity is for the phenomena to decline over time. It seems to it seems to have diminished during each. In, is, there's a tendency for it to diminish during each individual's uh, interaction within the group, and so I think the tricksters, the tricksters, probably more powerful than than these other th hypotheses that I've offered. Wow. So anything happen? That sounds very interesting and useful scientifically. Um, is there anything that you're doing now with um, uh, actual participation in um, purported psi, psi, psi phenomena? Uh, I meditate. That's all. Okay. That's the main thing. And I, I, I am, I'm thinking that. The actual psi phenomena is just a stepping stone. Uh, it's a, it's like a sign on a, on a, on a spiritual pathway. It's not, it's not the main thing. It's not the real event. That the interaction of the people, the rapport between people, is the most important thing. And the, the loss, the emptying of yourself, the forgetting of yourself, and be, becoming a, a selfless person, I think, is the, is the way to go. Is the direction. Uh, simplicity, patience, and compassion, I think, is, is, is where this is leading. Well, well, those are very nice things, but yet you keep talking about fear. Uh, what, why do you think people, your opinion, why do you think people fear Psy? Uh, to be honest, when I applied for college, I applied to Duke uh, because they had a parasite college uh, undergraduate study and I was accepted and then I turned it down because I was afraid to be honest <laughs> I chickened <laughs> out but what what do you think what is that fear I mean I really had no bad experiences nothing to be afraid of okay so Kate I, I'm unable to hear it real clearly but I heard you ask the question why do people fear sigh yes. is that pretty much yes it? yeah so uh, so here's a here's a theory that I'm offering. Okay. okay. If there is this thing called collective consciousness, it's a very it's a very important for all of us. The collective consciousness is very important for us to communicate and for living our lives, and and it creates this reality that we're living in. And it's it's interesting that the name of your your program is Shattered Reality, because if when people who are say levitating tables or doing some type of strange magic or whatever, that it's that's threatening to the consensual reality. That's damaging to the consensual reality. It's, it's, uh, it upsets the apple cart. And who can say it, it, it allows both the very positive and the very negative phenomena and the, the hierarchy and the, the normal people, the powerful people in our consensual reality have no control over that, that, mm. that, that, could damage and it could damage our 401ks. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious here, but not it, really, not entirely. Yeah. If you yeah. start knowing what's going to happen next in the stock market, and only ten people know that, then the stock market is sort of screwed for the rest of the people. Yeah. I guess it, some people win and other people lose, and so 
So there is a threat. And then the, the second thing which I, I've, I've come to, to believe or, or, or think is a valid way of thinking about things is that these, the, the, the pathway towards the paranormal involves a disruption of normal consciousness. Like when I sit and meditate, I'm disrupting my normal consciousness. And then that, that probably facilitates paranormal experience. But there's many other ways of disrupting normal consciousness, and psychosis is the most common way that normal consciousness is dis- disrupted. A person who is psychotic doesn't have control over whether it he or she can turn it on or off like I can when I'm meditating. And yet normal consciousness for that person is very disrupted. And similar to a mystical person, uh, consciousness, they, they, they've entered into some kind of altered state of consciousness and it's a, it's a disruption of the normal consciousness. So so this form of, of interest in the paranormal, it's a, it's a cousin of psychosis, which is there's a there's a real stigma connected to psychosis. That's that's what the real problem is because you're you're, you're dealing with the actual craziness. It's, it's fun to to be slightly crazy, but it's not so fun to be really crazy. It, and that's where the compassion is needed to to help people find their way and to 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 make the changes that are required to lead a more happy and productive life. And so I think we might just mention people who are listening to this, it, it would be good to look inside yourself and see what, what could you do to lead a more happy and productive life? What, what steps should you take? And uh, the paranormal phenomena is nice, but it's really just a guide post. It's just a way marker to, on this pathway towards towards achieving the the rapport and the the feeling of connectedness that that involves some kind of a deeper reality than the mundane reality that we're living in that was really very nicely put yes it certainly was (laughs) you're inspiring (laughs) but i want to just bring one thought into that and is that um is it true as i have read uh and you have studied some shamanistic cultures that in some of the indigenous shamanistic cultures, uh, the people who are the shaman are often would often be considered to be psychotic in the Western world. Well, uh, I've talked to psychiatrists in uh, like in Okinawa, and they said, well, there are some people who they if the psychosis fits the folklore of shamanism. Mm then it can be cured. So, so yes, they might be considered to be psychotic, but, they, but, but you know, psychosis is really just a continuum. And the, the people who end up in a psychiatric hospital, they're the people who have attempted suicide or they're unable to take care of themselves or they're a danger to themselves or to other people. There's many people who they've had many unusual experiences, but they're not actually psychotic. It's just that they are... Uh, there, there, there are people who are being who have been called to this pathway, you know, and and if they put some effort into it, they can develop th- their psychological health, Certainly. and they can they can be beneficial to others who are struggling because childhood trauma, childhood difficulty that for many people that's it sticks with you, you know, and it, it it's not an easy thing to overcome. And adult trauma, say, in my experiences in Vietnam, for example, that's not easy. It's not easy to get over that. And it's, it's something that you're going to, to be carrying with you. But with a little bit of effort and a little bit of, of focusing of the mind, you can become much more psychologically healthy. A lot of times it's just common sense. If you're drinking too much, give it up. You know, sure. if you're angry, if you're angry all the time, you're going to have to figure out how to get it up. If you if you can't get along with people, you'll have to figure out how to do that. You know, so so a lot of times it's easy for outsiders to tell you what to do, but you need to to be able to tell yourself what to do. Well, I think that we have come through the full hour here and should probably um, be bidding you adieu. However, I cannot begin to thank you, but I will thank you very much. I think that you should mention the name of your book and and, uh, the publishing company, just so people can go out and buy the book, and you could become uh, 
more successful as we all want to be. Okay. Well, the title of the book is The Entity Letters of Sociologists on the Trail of a Supernatural Mystery. The most common way people get the book is they go onto Amazon and they type in The Entity Letters and James McLennan, or it'll come right up. The publishers, Anomalous, Anomalous Books, uh, at anomalousbooks.com, but I think Amazon probably would be the easiest way to get it. Okay. All thank right. you so very much for having me. It's well, well thank you so much. I know you probably can't hear me, but thank you. It's been a great discussion. Yes, thank you. F, on behalf of ourselves here, uh, Kate, Bill, and Farusha, we want to thank you for being on the show, and we hope to invite you back at some time, um, perhaps when you finish with your next um your next book, which uh, is going to uh, correlate all of the letters uh, and the experiences of um, the gentleman of all of a sudden, why is my brain? Richards? Richards, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, this book talks about that. It talks about the letters. Actually, I have another book about the Vietnam War where I'm going to, I compare my stories with uh, an Iranian guy who's a veteran of the Iran-Iraq War. Oh. And uh, the, there's a little bit of paranormal phenomena in there, so don't worry, it's still there. And we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that one comes out. Okay. okay. Well, once again, thanks so much, and bye for now. Take care. Bye for now. Thank bye. you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Well, Kate, wasn't that interesting? Yeah, it was. Um, I, I'll tell you, talk about EVP. Have you heard a lot of crackles and stuff? Yes, I did oh, hear okay. a lot of crackles and stuff. Mm. Uh, and I don't know whether... Uh, uh, Dr. McLennan was moving papers on his desk. Uh, uh, no. I could, see, I could see a lot of, you know, on the uh, waveform, mm -hmm. yes. his track. I could see a lot of Oh, that. it's on his track? Okay, Okay, good. so maybe he was see, moving papers. Son of a gun. Okay. But um, in any case, mm -hmm. in any case, um, we just finished episode 74. I want to invite our listeners to comment on any of our platforms, and I will remind you that we can be found at shatteredrealitypodcast.wordpress.com, shatteredrealitypodcast.com, on um, Facebook, and also on YouTube, uh, where we are amassing a number of followers. So you can comment on any of those sites. I would also invite you, listeners, if you have had a paranormal experience that you would like to share with us here at Shattered Reality, that you would contact me and uh, or, uh, or Shattered Reality podcast and uh, tell us what it is that you experienced and whether you would like to be on personally or you would like me or Kate to read your experience. Email. Uh, but I, I'd like to make a point on that, too, is that uh, we have gazillion experiences every day. But when something is strange, how it stays with you through the years, you don't forget it. Uh, very vivid memory. Yes, just uh, even in regards to this gentleman mm -hmm. and the book that started the whole thing, Black Elk Speaks, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, yeah, it stayed you, in my mind that it, it appeared mysteriously on my bookshelf. Now, I don't claim, there's no way to prove, and I don't claim that this was paranormal, uh, uh, but the fact that it was odd, odd not once, but twice it showed up, it stayed with me. Mm -hmm. Anything that's out of the ordinary always does. You, you, you just don't forget it. It's like, boop. I don't know. Do you have any uh, anything that you want to share with us now, Kate? Before? Nope, nope, I'm good. Oh, one more thing to mention to everybody is that our next podcast is likely to be on or around September 11th. And in order to uh, sort of commemorate that experience, uh, which all of us here in the New York area certainly had some very strange experiences, if we could get a few listeners to write down their experiences, uh, the odd experiences around 9-11 uh, that they would like to share with us. I know that I had some strange experience prior to 9-11, and I know of some kids who drew pictures of planes hitting the buildings before 9-11. So if you have had some anomalous experience around 9-11, please write it down and send it to us. Thank you. Goodbye, Goodbye from Shattered Reality. reality.